do before I do any of the things in the picture is uh, I, I draw in my sketchbook, kind of like, like this. And, and for a long time, I thought these drawings just had no particular value except practice. You know, it's like, it's like being a football player, the value of going out and hitting the tackling dummy uh, Monday through Friday uh, in itself is nothing, but it helps you play the game. And so I've been drawing in my sketchbook for years. Uh, and when I decided for the show, I wanted to get, come back to figurative work, so I would go to the sketchbooks uh, and find some drawings that I could translate into the printmaking tr process and try and ease myself into figurative work. So uh, I would find a drawing, I would make a small woodcut of it, because a big woodcut takes longer to do than a small woodcut, right? Uh, I would make one good print of it on paper, and I'd actually print by hand with a spoon, because um, there's a certain quality that occurs, and you have a certain amount of control if you're, by rubbing the back of the paper. You get just the right amount of ink in the right area. So I make that one print, scan it, and make a big transparency, and then put that transparency on the silk screen. Because people have been asking me, well, how do you, why are these called serographs, which is silk screen, when there's a big woodcut in there? So this is my explanation of how that happens. Um, the, the woodcut is what's called the key image that creates uh, the most of the detail and information in the image. And the colors are laid in with very simple cut stencils. And one of the things I was trying very hard to do in this work was to really simplify the process a bit. So it's one woodcut and then these cut paper stencils. So what I would simply do is I put tracing paper over that, that printout. Uh, I trace the shapes that I want to be violet in this case, cut them out of that piece of tracing paper, put them on the bottom of a silk screen, pull the ink across. And the decisions you have to make uh, are very, it sort of forces you to make decisions that you, that you don't know what's going to happen. It's a little bit like this, but not so much. Because I have to plan where that violet is going to go and what that's going to do to everything underneath it and everything that's going to go on top of it. And I have to kind of cross my fingers and, and hope it's going to work. But it's a very simple, very direct process. If you have a little squeegee and a little screen and a little kid, you can teach them to do this in an afternoon. And they can become as proficient as I am because it's, it's a very simple process. Uh, as long as it's safe giving them an X-Acto knife, uh, you can do it. Uh, but, and I love the directness of it. It's just, it's immediate. The, 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 there's a little bit of trickery in getting that, that first screen made, but after this, it's just like simple, simple, simple. And I, I really like that. I also, in this body work, started limiting the, the number of colors I was printing. Um, the one with the least has two, and the one with the most has five. And typically, I was printing a lot of colors in the old days. Um, so, getting to the imagery a little bit. Um, I really like the nature of woodcut. It's, it has a great long history in Western art. Uh, I've always admired it, again, because of its simplicity, because it has a vocabulary that's very small and you have to do as much as you can uh, with that limited vocabulary. Uh, this is Elizabeth Cabot, sharecropper. Um, and I like the quote from Sarah Young because it, it printmaking prevents you from overthinking. And that's, that's why I like it. I can overthink a painting to death. And if you remember the paintings I've shown here before, sometimes they're very tight, very meticulous uh, paintings of sandwiches and things like that. And so this is really a way of, of um, preventing myself from overthinking the work. Um, and this is another great quote, quote Jim Dine, uh, I make prints because it's another way to talk. And I, and I still paint. I do both, but I really, right now, this is the way I want to speak to the world, to my artwork, to the prints. This is the, the drawing from my sketchbook that became the print that's, that's uh, the guy sleeping in the airplane. And uh, the sketch is from 2004. I, I didn't know what I would do with these things. Like, sort of like Scott, I had been just drawing things. And, and in my sketchbook, there were two things going on. One is I didn't care who saw them or if they were ever seen again. The other was that, unlike anything I've been doing in the last 20 years, they were almost always drawings of people. And the people were absent from my serious work, uh, but they were always 
in my sketchbook. And I think I've, I've told Jason um, at, at one point, and I've told several other people, I've always wanted to come back to making the, the series artwork using the figure. And so this show was my first foray, hopefully not my last, in doing that. We'll see what you guys think. Um, so I would go to my sketchbook. I was flipping through, looking for things that would translate. Um, and I was really trying to get to this idea of, of having a, um, trying to get the relationship with the person that I had in the sketch back into the, the print. And I, I thought this quote from uh, uh, Evan Pushak was, was good. But in boredom is exactly when we feel time and being the most acutely. And so if you look at the images, that are in the in the show, it's a lot of people who are in a quiet moment. They're reading, but you don't see what they're reading. They might be sleeping, uh, like this guy was, uh, but then with your, their phone, they're in that that sort of quiet moment. They're really not, certainly not aware that I'm I'm looking at them, but they're really not very self-aware at or aware of the environment at all. They're very much. In, in the moment with themselves. Uh, and I, I was trying to capture that in the drawings. That's sort of why I would look around the room and go, okay, this person's sitting there reading their book. You're gonna be the one I draw. Uh, but I was trying to keep that idea in the work. Um, this is a great quote from Edward Hopper, the inner life of the human being is vast and varied, is a vast and varied realm. It does not concern itself alone with simulating stimulating arrangements of color, form, and design. And I, I think that's important because uh, what Hopper would do and what I tried to do was use the formal elements of art but not make it obvious that that was the game I was playing. I'm, I'm really trying to sort of figure out in my own way what this figure is doing, what this person might be thinking, what that little world is that they're, they're in at that moment. And that's what Hopper really did in his work. I think that's why we really respond to his, his paintings and drawings. Um, and in some ways, I'm also being a voyeur because when I was drawing these people, they never knew I was drawing them. If they looked up at me, I looked down, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of doing this. Uh, if I had a sketchbook right now, I might have gotten three or four of you and you wouldn't have known it. Because um, what I'm trying to do is not have them engage me. I don't want a conversation. I just want to look at them and see what they're doing out there and, and put that in the book. So um, I'm always looking for the person who's looking away. And oftentimes that means I'm getting people in profile. I've got a ton of drawings in, of people who are one row ahead of me and across the aisle in the airplane. Because those people never know I'm drawing them, but I can see them. Um, but it really, if you look at them, you'll see that they are all voyeuristic. Even the one of my wife had, uh, in her iPad, you know, with her iPad. Um, I know that in that moment, she's not paying any attention to me. Uh, she's, she's there uh, reading whatever she's reading. Um, she's in her moment. I, I, one of the things I really respond to in them, first off, it's, I love seeing the, the, the face, seeing, seeing you working with the figure. But it also looks like it's a relationship between the figure and light mm -hmm. that's really a major part of these. And, and that color standing for light uh, seems to be really important. Was that a theme that you were thinking about? Yeah, I, I, it's almost, I, I had a, a probably, a more than normally classic training in observational drawing, and so I sort of can't forget that. It's just how I operate when I'm in the studio. Uh, part of it is that the, the image starts as a black and white drawing, and a, and a fairly representational one. So light is always in there. And then it becomes a black and white woodcut. So again, that's sort of the information I, I have uh, but yeah, color is a stand-in for light, or color is sort of a reinforcement for whatever's going on. Um, the one that's called stone, the guy sort of sleeping, 
diagonally in a big red, um, it's called a split fountain where the color changes from red to almost clear, uh, is sort of reinforcing that, that idea of light. And then of course he's got the, you know, he's sleeping in an airport and he's got the, um, the fluorescent fixtures over his head, which I, you know, I, I always love people who are so, so tired and so they, they sort of stopped being aware of this very public environment and they just decided that they're going to sleep with the lights on and people running around and announcements on the, on the PA and all that kind of thing. I mean, that, that's, just, that's just wonderful. And I, and I think that uh, the reason I made sure those lights were in there and that sense of light was on him is because that's, that dichotomy of that sort of inner moment in this very public place. You also got the, the light of an iPod or of someone shielding their face yeah. from the light or the window. So that, uh, you know, that I, 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 I yeah. don't agree with that. Yeah, I, I really like those. Um, the, the, the two where the, the shadow sort of gets rid of the face. I mean, that was the whole reason for doing that. These guys are standing here and they're trying to see something. And, you know, when you want to see something and create shadow, you're casting a shadow over your eyes. And of course, when you turn that into high contrast, your eyes and everything else disappears. It just becomes a silhouette. It becomes a really interesting shape, too. So, yeah, I, mean, I guess I can't, I can't forget the formal stuff. It's just, it's too much a part of who I am. Is there a narrative to the, the subjects that you create? I mean, do you, do you think of a, a backstory for these individuals? Or is it just an observation? Um, I, I can't, yeah, I mean, I, I always think about who they might be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, judge not lest ye be judged, right? But of course, we're always judging people. We're always uh, mm -hmm. trying to figure out who they might be, what their story is, what they're thinking. And so, uh, and, and the tales may or may not allude to that, but um, I, I think who I thought they were, because it was, it was interesting. I think this may be a better answer. When I was going through my sketchbooks, I would remember vividly something I thought about that person when I drew them. And, and the drawings, uh, some of them are pretty recent. Some of them, like that one, goes back 13 years. But I remember something about that person. Uh, and um, that always, that, I think that little narrative, that little story, whatever it was, kind of stuck with me all the way through. And it did force me to make decisions about color uh, and, and uh, emphasis in certain areas. Like the, the one I used it as, a, as an example, the guy in seat 43B, it's a seat number I made up. I couldn't remember what seat he was in. That was 13 years ago. But um, I remember him uh, being very dark, not in skin tone, but dark because that window was on the other side of him. And so he was just this very dark, warm colored person. And he was, he was a, a person who seemed who might, uh, very sculpted and rough, but had relaxed so much. It was, it, I, I remember the, sort of that, that odd relationship between this person who looked very tough and that very sort of softened face because he had fallen asleep. And I, I think in that one, I tried to kind of walk that line. I never knew who the guy was or what he did. I never talked to him. He never knew I was drawing him. Um, but I remember that feeling I got from him, that he was, he was somebody who probably when he was awake could be pretty aggressive, but when he was asleep, he was 